everybody. Well, we're learning new this morning. Joy to the world on a night like no other. Emmanuel, God is with us. Beggars and kings, let us come and adore him. Rest in his peace and by a pretty good way to start our December. The reason for Christmas is that Jesus came. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Uh, I just want to say welcome to you. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning to get to worship this God. Uh, we just believe that God has something for every single one of us individually. Uh, so there's anticipation of what God's going to do this morning. If you are new with us, we do want to say welcome to you. We're glad that you chose to join us. If you would not mind, there is a card in the seat back in front of you. It says connect on it. If you'd be willing to fill this out for us, um, there is a box at the exit doors that you can drop it into. It's just our way to be able to follow up with you, begin the journey with you, answer questions you might have, that sort of thing. 
On the other side of that card, it is our prayer card. We have a phenomenal prayer team here, uh, and we are a pray first church. We believe in the power of prayer. We believe that God hears our prayers and responds. And so if there's anything that you're carrying, anything going on in your life, you know, as we enter into this holiday season, it can be heavy. Uh, we don't want you to walk that alone. You weren't meant to walk that alone. And so please uh, utilize that prayer card so that our prayer team can be going to battle for you. At K1, we have a vision that uh, sort of roots everything that we do here, and that is we want to help people come to know God for the first time or in a deeper way. We want to help people find freedom. We want to help you discover your God purpose and then to go and live it out. And so this, is, this just roots everything that we do. And we have a class called Life Track. It's a four-step class that just helps you understand what does this really mean? Where does it come from in scripture? How are we structured uh, as a church to help you along the journey? Um, we do take a break from Life Track uh, the month of December. So if you've not done Life Track, if you want to put a reminder in your calendar to come back uh, at January 1st, well, first week of January, I don't know what the date is, something. First week of January uh, for step one to do life track with us. We'd love to see you there. Okay, next week is pretty exciting because we get to watch our kids' Christmas program, which is always a highlight of the year. Not only are they stinking adorable, but there's something about the simplicity of a child's message that helps us understand the reality of God in a powerful way. And so we believe that's going to happen uh, next week. So invite people, come, let's celebrate what God's doing in our kids. Then the next week, December 17th, we're going to go back to one service at 1045. And we'll be at that one service until January 21st. So make sure to mark that down. We'll continue to remind you about that. Part of living it out here at K1, I'm going to share, I'm going to come over here to you guys. This table's right there. Um, part of uh, how we live it out through our outreach team is they give us opportunities each month to be out in the community, to be loving on people, to being kind, that sort of thing. And so for this month, what we're doing is we've adopted Edison Primary School in Kankakee. And what we want to do is we want to be able to buy a book for every student and to be able to get a gift card for teachers to be able to get some necessary supplies. Because I don't know if you know this, but a lot of teachers spend their personal money on classroom supplies. And so we want to show up for them. We want them to be, they just can't believe that K-1 would come and adopt their school and just show up for them in that way. So I'm asking, there are cards, there are trees in the lobby. Um, one of them says $5, that's to get a book. The other one says $20, that's to get a gift card for teachers. You can also go on the app or online to our giving section um, and give through there. Just select the drop down, just select other. This is our last week to be able to get money in, to be able to do this for them. So please, are we going to do it? Are we going to do it? Okay, awesome. Uh, the last thing that I want to say is that we are starting a new series today. It's going to take us through the Advent season. And we're going to look at different things that were accomplished by the fact that Jesus came. Yes, little baby Jesus was born and placed in a manger. But Jesus coming to earth accomplished so much. And we're going to take some time to look at what those things are. And so Pastor Dave is going to kick that off for us this morning. It's going to be a good morning. Go ahead and stand up, greet people around you, and we're going to go back into worship. And 
That's right, church. You guys believe that today. Come on, sing it. I will believe. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like Power of Jesus, let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like His power. There's nothing that. Amen.
the grave has no claim on me. Sing that out again. your living hope. Before you get seated, I want to say this. Today, this morning, we're going to talk about one aspect of living the way of Jesus, what that means. And the challenge is, is for us to then go live that way. If you are not following God yet, you know, like, I don't even know what this is. Today, today, we're going to talk about that. I'm going to give you a, an opportunity if you want to just say, yeah, I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow and I want to live his way. Because if we live the way of Jesus, as we see, there's not going to be these wars that are happening out there. If we live the way of Jesus, there's not going to be divorce anymore. If we live the way of Jesus, abuse of women, abuse of kids will end. You believe that? And I want to live the way of Jesus, don't you? And I want to spread that way everywhere I go. So that is the challenge. Oh, Holy Spirit, as we come to you every week, please, please pour yourself down upon us and start to move in our lives, op open our eyes and our hearts to the way of Jesus. If we don't know you yet, I'm praying that we start to follow you today, and then may you empower us to live your way so that we can expand your kingdom one person at a time every day so that we can take this world for you Make it the way you created it to be where everybody lives in right relationship with each other. So have your way in your mighty name, we pray and ask. Amen. You may be seated. Holy communion. Holy communion. Why? Like, why? Why? Well, in short, to remember and to celebrate the reason why God came to us in the person of Jesus Christ. So why did God choose to do that? It's a relevant question at this time of year. And, and if we're living out this action plan that the Apostle Paul, an early follower of Jesus, gave us at the end of Colossians, we talked about this two weeks ago. And if this is your first time here this morning, I invite you to take a picture of this action plan because this is how we are going to take the world for Jesus Christ. Praying for opportunities to proclaim Christ. Developing relationships with, e e uh, with people. Embracing every opportunity that we have to proclaim Christ. By how we live, and we're going to press into that this morning. By what we say, and we're going to press into that this morning. And then by inviting people to come follow this Jesus that's changed our life. And when we live that way, we may actually get the opportunity, maybe this, this Christmas season, to explain why God came. So... How would you answer that question? Why did God choose to come and to live with us in the person of Jesus Christ? Why? 
Well, I, I, I like the big picture response that Jesus gives to that question in John chapter 3, beginning of verse 16, where, where, where Jesus says this, for God so loved the world. And let me just stop right there because this is a bold faith claim. For God so loved the world. I mean, we're, right off the bat, we're saying, and, and, and modern scientists say that the universe now had a beginning point. And the only question is, is well, what do we believe? It's a faith statement. We either it just happened or this God created it. For this God so loved the world. No other religion makes the claim that this God came to us in human, as a human to experience what we experience and then to do what we'll see what, what Jesus did for us. No, no other religion makes that claim. The, the second biggest religion in the world is, is Islam. And the God that they worship, which is Allah, Allah doesn't love. I don't know if you knew that or not. If you come from a Muslim background, you, you know what I'm talking about. Allah doesn't love. I, I learned that, and you can study about it, but I learned it. I, I attended a, uh, the biggest mosque in Kansas City, and when I was there, they gave this talk, and in one part of their talk, they said, we just want to make it clear that Allah doesn't love you. And they got done with their talk, and then they asked if anybody had any questions, and there's, I don't know, 500, 600 Muslims uh, there, and, and, I, and I, I couldn't help myself. I raised my hand. I, I was still a recovering lawyer, right? So I was like asking a lot of questions. So I asked, I said, well, if Allah doesn't love me, why would I ever want to follow and worship Allah? Well, that invoked a very, uh, how should I say it, uh, an interesting response from the 500 Muslims that were there. Put it this way, I didn't ask my follow-up question about grace, okay? <laughs> yes. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So right off the bat, God is telling us that this love that he feels for us, it's just not a feeling. It's an action. For God so loved the world that he came, that, that, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him, and that phrase is so important for us to understand, the Greek is pistio ice. It, it, it doesn't mean just giving a verbal assent that Jesus, I believe Jesus is the son of God. It, it's, it's entrusting our entire being to him. It's giving him our complete allegiance. Jesus, you are Lord of my life. You control my life. I live your way, no other way. So for God so, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish. What's that? Well, that means being separated from God forever. That is living in broken relationship from God forever. It's what we call hell. Bottom line, that's what hell is, broken relationship. And we all have experienced broken relationship here, right? And nobody here likes it. Why? Because it's hell. So why experience hell twice? So you won't perish if you believe in him, but instead we will inherit eternal life. What is that? That's just living in right relationship with God and everyone else who follows God forever and forever. Bottom line, that's what heaven is. And then verse 17, again, answering this question, why did God came? And I like, again, how Jesus puts it, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. That's not why he came. He didn't come to condemn. But rather, he came to save the world through him. Save us from what? Well, the ultimate consequence of our sin choices, which again is eternal death. That's hell, separation from God forever. How did Jesus accomplish that? Answer, you can say it with me if you want, the cross on the cross, Jesus' body was broken and poured out. And I want you to see that because sometimes we just we don't want to visualize that. We want to skip over that. But I want you to see that and take that in this morning. On the cross, Jesus' body was broken and his blood was poured out to bring healing and restoration to the people of this world, that is you and me, so that we can live the way that God created us to live, in right relationship with God, in right relationship with each other, and in right relationship with God's creation. And so the Apostle Paul says this, and again, Apostle Paul, an earlier follower of Jesus, he says this in Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 19, he says, For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. You mean, well, what does that mean, Pastor Dave? Remember, God created us to live in right relationship with each other. 
When we, sin, when we, when we choose to go our own way, when we choose to sin because we think we know best, we break relationship with God and with each other. In order for that relationship to be restored, the way God set things up is that blood needs to be shed to bring us back into right relationship. Number of reasons by, why, but one of the reasons is, is to remind us that that's what sin causes. Sin causes death. And so, and so blood has to be shed. In the Old Testament for the Israelites, what that means is, it means is that they had to bring a, a sin sacrifice, an animal sacrifice, as a sin sacrifice. And it couldn't just be any animal. It couldn't be a lame animal. It had to be an unblemished animal. And so in this case, with, Jesus, with God coming to us in the person of Jesus Christ, being fully God, sinless, and then also being fully human, like when, when he's on this cross, there's actually, it's real blood being spilled then he could restore our relationship. He could reconcile our relationship with God. He could right our relationship with God. And so Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning of verse 3. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth. That's new life. Into a living hope. And we just sang about that. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance, and this is eternal spiritual life, that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Amen? Amen. And so we followers of Jesus, we take part in a ritual, a meal called Holy Communion to remember and to celebrate everything that God has done for us through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Holy communion, though, as it is with every ritual, is about something far more greater than the ritual itself. Holy communion is about a way of life. Individually and as a, collectively as a, as a local church. It's about being broken and poured out for the sake of others. Why? So that they may come to know this God who saves us through Jesus Christ. So that they may find freedom in Christ from every stronghold that the evil one may have on them. So that they may discover their God purpose in Christ and so that they may begin to live out as a follower of Jesus Christ by then being broken and poured out for the sake of someone else. The Apostle Paul, this early follower of Jesus, he gets this. And so he writes a letter to his friends at the church in Corinth. And he says this at one point in the letter. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning of verse 8. He says this, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. It's clear that things have been difficult for Paul and his, and his companions in living as a follower of Jesus Christ. But he doesn't get bitter. He, he doesn't complain. He, he doesn't lose hope. Instead, he says this in, in verse 10. He says, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. So Jesus allowed his body to be broken and his blood to be poured out for the sake of others. And so the apostle Paul is allowing his body to be broken and his blood to be poured out for the sake of others. And in some ways, this was literal for Paul. If you read 2 Corinthians, you will see that Paul was beaten and he was flogged until he bled. But Paul is talking about something far deeper here. And Paul is talking about a, a whole way of life. Paul has given himself to something greater than himself. He's given himself to a cause, spreading the gospel message of Jesus Christ, proclaiming Christ to everyone that comes in his sphere of influence. He has given himself to this cause that is greater than himself. He's planting churches. He's taking offerings from, for the poor from one church and taking them to a, another church. He is giving, uh, he's got traveling from city to city, giving spiritual direction to those who need it. And it's hard. And it costs something. And he gets criticized. He gets tired. He gets frustrated. And he gets betrayed. 
and his heart gets broken again and again. But, but Paul doesn't lose hope. He continues to be broken and poured out for the sake of others. He continues in verse 11 by saying this, for we, that is followers of Jesus, that's you and me, for we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. The phrase given over is important here, and I'll make sure that we understand what Paul's talking about. Paul is saying to us that it's about dying to self. And being broken, we think of in the literal sense, but being broken has this connotation as well. It's, it's being reduced in rank. So Jesus, being God, reduced himself in rank by coming to be one of us. Paul, who was the best of the best in Jewish society, he was at the elite level as a Pharisee, he reduced his rank and stepped out of that to be a person, a follower of Jesus who spreads the gospel message of Jesus. So Paul's telling us here, when we're being given over, over to die to self, to take a servant type mentality into our interactions with, with other people so that, we can, so that God can use us to bring healing and restoration to someone, which may be spiritual healing, it may be mental, it may be emotional, it may be physical. And he's telling us here, when, when he's saying being given over to death, he's telling us here that when we do that, when, when we identify with the spiritual, the mental, the emotional, or physical suffering of someone, and then actually commit to doing something about it, actually helping in some way, it will cost us something. It will be inconvenient, so to speak. So Paul continues in verse 12. He says this, so then death is at work in us. Paul and Timothy. But life is at work in you, the Corinthians. So how can the death that's at work in Paul and Timothy bring life to their friends, the Corinthians? Well, that's how that's how Holy Communion works. For someone to receive, someone has to give something. For someone to be fed when they're hungry, someone has to provide food. If someone somewhere benefits, someone somewhere, folks, ha has paid something. And God brings healing and restoration to the people of this world, to you and me through the breaking of Christ's body and the pouring out of Christ's blood. And God continues to bring healing and restoration to the people of this world through the body of Christ, who the Apostle Paul is telling the Corinthian church is them. So they, this Corinthian church, we here at K1, man, we're the body, and we're the body of Christ. That's how we are to live. So follow me here. See if you follow. I'm going to put a slide up on the screen. Follow me here. Holy communion ultimately represents the way of Jesus. And that way of Jesus is being broken and poured out for the sake of others. The body of Christ, the church, is supposed to reflect the way of Jesus to the world. The body of Christ, the church, is made up of followers of Jesus. Followers of Jesus, then, that, that's you and me. We're supposed to reflect the way of Jesus by living a holy communion life. By being broken and poured out for the sake of others, which, again, may be inconvenient. Uh, not maybe, it will be. It, it, may it may cause us to, to give of our time and our energy and our financial resources to bring spiritual, mental, emotional, or physical healing to someone that God puts in our sphere of influence. Living a broken and poured out life, living a holy communion life also means getting to know and interacting with someone that's not like us. Apostle Paul puts it this way in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning of verse 20, he says this, to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win Jews. That wasn't hard for Paul because he was a Jew. 
Then he says a couple things here. Just go with me because he's dealing with certain things going on in their culture. He says this, To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, although I am not free from God's law, but under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. And then I want to press in here on verse 22. He says this, To the weak, I became weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Blessings being someone else coming to start to follow the way of Jesus. So in other words, Paul is telling us that he is actually putting himself in the shoes of somebody else to connect them to Jesus. Why? So that they may experience new life in Jesus. So they may experience new hope in Jesus. So that they may become a follower of Jesus who then lives a life of being broken and poured out for the sake of someone else. That, my friends, is living a holy communion life. Living a holy communion life is living an empathetic life. Empathy is trying to see it like someone else sees it. Or trying to feel it like someone else feels it. Empathy is not trying to fix people. It's important for us to understand. We don't do the fixing. We don't do the saving. We don't do the transforming. We're just a vessel. It's Jesus who does that. We're just there. And so, what, so when we live an empathetic life, a holy communion life, uh, we, are, we are with people, which then fuels connection with people. And when we connect with people by living an empathetic life, they may act, we may actually earn the right then to speak and to share about the way of Jesus, what it means to live a broken and poured out life. <sighs> so living a broken and poured out life, again, is living an empathetic life. It's... It's seeing people in their greatest time of need. Think about it this way. Put yourself in the other person's shoes, the one that, think about it when you're struggling, when you're hurting, when you're wounded, when you're limping, when you're doubting, when you're questioning, when you're barely hanging on, when you may be moments away from another relapse. You don't need someone judging you or lecturing you, or evaluating you, or reassuring you and telling you, oh, it's going to be okay. Now you need someone who is with you. Who's really listening to you. Who's really trying to understand. When someone can look you in the eye after listening to you, and then say, man, I, I don't even know what to say right now but I am with you as you work through this and they actually mean it. Oh my goodness, it can save us. So the apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22. He says, to the weak I became weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. Later in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29, Paul says, who is weak and I do not feel weak. I wonder sometimes if tears are being put on the paper as he's writing this, as he's thinking about people he loves. Who is led into sin? And I do not inwardly burn. Mm. As I look into your eyes this morning, I just see people. People I get to know and live life with and know that I, and I just intercede on your behalf that you may live the way of Jesus. Why? Because I love you. Sorry. At the heart of the church, in the soul of holy communion, is identifying with the suffering of someone. And then committing to doing something about it. It's like telling people out there in the flow of everyday life and maybe in here as we live life with each other. We see you. And we are with you. I 
Not only is Holy Communion, not only, is the, not only does Holy Communion remind us that we, like Christ, are to be broken and poured out for the sake of others, but it also reminds us that Jesus came to die for everyone. And that his death united everyone into one body. A body that reflects God's image and God's kingdom to the world. Apostle Paul puts it this way. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, he says, There's neither Jew nor Gentile. Like, there's no more division here in God's body. We're all working together. There's neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. You see, in the temple area in Jerusalem, everything was arranged spatially. So one part of the temple area was actually the temple itself. And in the temple was a, a, a place called the Holy of Holies, where it was believed that God's presence uh, was there in some unique way. And then outside that Holy of Holies was the court of, of the priests, where they would uh, do their sacrificial duties. And then outside the court of the, the priest was the, the court of the Jews. And they had a Jewish men court and they had a Jewish women court. And then outside that court was the outer court where the Gentiles would come. And if you were a Gentile and you wanted to get into the court of the Jews, you were confronted with this wall. There was various gates to get through that wall, but you're confronted with this wall. And on that wall was inscribed these words. If you're a Gentile and you come into the court of the Jews, you will be killed. Ooh, ah, subtle message, right? Folks, they took this very seriously during this time period. So seriously in, in Acts chapter 21 and 22 that the apostle Paul, who was a Pharisee <laughs> in, the, in, 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 in the Jewish world, who's now a follower of Jesus Christ, when he comes back from one of his uh, trip, missionary trips, he goes into the Jewish temple to do the Jewish purification rites, and he had brought with him into Jerusalem uh, an Ephesian from the Ephesians church, right? And the Jewish leaders thought that Paul actually brought this Ephesian into the court of the Jews, and so they went, he didn't, and so, but they thought he did, so they went and they took Paul and they started to beat him to death, but a Roman stepped in and saved his life. That's how seriously the Jews took this division. So the Jews, God's people, who were supposed to connect people to God, were actually acting as a barrier to God because of their religious rules. Ooh, ah, I hope we never live that way. Mm. Again, subtle message, maybe not so subtle. For the Gentiles, this wall, it had a big impact because it was believed, again, that God was in the Holy of Holies. And so the closer you got to the Holy of Holies, the closer you could get to God. And so the Jews were preventing them from getting closer to God. And so Paul writes this letter to the church in Ephesus, which is a mixed group of Jewish followers of Jesus, Gentile followers of Jesus, male followers of Jesus, female followers of Jesus, master followers of Jesus, slave followers of Jesus, Greek followers of Jesus, Roman followers of Jesus. So he writes this letter to this mixed group of people, and he says to them this at one part of the letter. It's Ephesians chapter 2, beginning of verse 14. He says, for he himself, that's Jesus, is our peace, who has made the two groups, and he's talking about Jew and Gentile, one, and has destroyed the bearer, barrier, this dividing wall of hostility that we just saw, that wall. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. So in his flesh, what, what, is, what is Paul talking about here? What, what does he mean? What, what, did, what did Jesus really do? Well, for Paul, Jesus' death was the end to a whole system of regulations and commands. And one of those regulations and commands that Paul's talking about is this wall that we just saw that separated this one group of people, the Jews, from another group of people, the Gentiles. That wall, which Paul calls the wall of hostility, has been destroyed by Jesus. That, that old way of thinking, that old way of doing things, one of which was that a Jew could never associate with a Gentile, that old way is no longer relevant. Why? Because Jesus has made peace. Why did Jesus do that? Well, Paul continues in verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 2 when he says this, his purpose, that is Jesus' purpose, was to create in himself 
one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility in holy communion. In Christ's body. In Christ's blood. Everything is being reconciled to God so that we can live together in unity as one body. This is why the way of Jesus is world changing. Could you see if Jews and Palestinians began to follow the way of Jesus? <laughs> They'd be having a party. They'd be living life together. <laughs> oh my God, please, please bring your peace upon our world. Isn't that your prayer? <laughs> so this, Christ's body, Christ's blood, broken and poured out for us to show us the way of Jesus, which, which if we live that way is all about telling everyone who God is and what God's kingdom is all about, again, where everyone lives in right relationship with each other, where everyone lives to the best interest of each other, where everyone makes sure that no one goes without. And so holy communion, holy communion then is the new humanity. Paul calls this the new humanity. Holy communion is about the new humanity where we are broken and poured out for the sake of others. In the new humanity, in a local church like K1, people who previously had nothing in common because of some difference, because of some social, economic, generational, racial, or cultural difference, now realize that the only thing they have in common is the only thing that matters, Jesus Christ. In the new humanity, in, the lo in a local church like K1, people who previously had been on the opposite side of some dividing wall because of some difference now realize that that, that wall has been destroyed by Jesus. In the new humanity, in a local church like K1, people who previously had fought about a whole array of issues now realize that peace has been made by, say his name with me, Jesus. And there's nothing left to fight about. In the new humanity, we hear perspectives that we normally wouldn't hear. We walk in other people's shoes. We realize that the judgments that we had about that group of people no longer hold up because we're getting to know one of those, and it's changing everything. I mean, in the new humanity, our world gets bigger. Our perspectives go from black and white to color. Our sensitivities are heightened, and we are rescued from sameness and uniformity because that wall of hostility has come down and peace has been made. A local church like K1 is the new humanity on display for all the world to see. People are looking at us to see what God's kingdom is all about. People are looking to us to see what this God is all about. Again, this God is about all of us living in right relationship with each other, with God, and with God's creation. In the new humanity, in a local church like K1, people who normally would never hang out together, they come to worship and be transformed by God through song, through the word, and through sharing Holy Communion together. In the new humanity, in a, in a community faith like K1, you have college students. Do we have any college students here? Okay, and we have people in their 70s and 80s. Do we have folks in their 70s and 80s? Okay, how about 60s? Yeah, 50s? Yeah. Not all churches are like that. In the new humanity, in a, in a local church like K1, we have people who are in the trades. We had a lot of them in the, at the 9 o'clock service. Do we have any people in the trades here? 
Okay, come to the 9 o'clock service. They will help you. In the New Humanity, in a local church like K1, uh, we, ha- we have therapists and we have counselors. Do, do we have any? Of- yeah, okay. In the New Humanity, we have, uh, we have couples that have more than enough. Like Kim and Steve Graven. And then we have couples who just got married and are scraping to get by, like Parker and Haley. <laughs> okay, she's saying no, don't. Okay, you guys, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Maybe, maybe, maybe they're not scraping to get by, but man, they would love a free meal. <laughs> what happens in a new community, community in a local church like this, these two meet, these two have met, and they're living life together, they're doing things together, they're playing golf together, they're breathing into each other, they're learning from each other. In the new humanity, in a local church like K1, you have fifth graders who twice a month go out and visit seniors at their homes. And they get to know, they ask questions, and you should be there to hear the questions they ask these seniors, and then these seniors ask them. And then what these fifth graders do is they get to know, they ask, they ask these seniors, hey, is there anything that we can pray for you about? And these people share. And then these fifth graders, they get up, they lay hands on, and they go to prayer battle for them. This one means a lot to me. This was this, this Wednesday night. That's, that's Dwayne and Mary Jo Haskins. And some of you may know, but many of you may not, is, is Mary Jo is coming to the end of her life, and she probably will not make it until Christmas. But she wanted these fifth graders to come because she just wanted to experience their joy in their life, and she wanted to breathe into them. And these fifth graders, they got to see and experience a woman of God joy get closer and closer to death in a very gracious way. And my goodness, I believe that left an indelible impact on the lives of these fifth graders. They will never forget that experience in the new community, in a local church like K1. People who, again, normally wouldn't hang together, they get together, they meet, they, they listen to each other, they ask questions, they begin to live life together in some way. In the new humanity, in a church like K1, they become we. They become us. And we therefore begin to live in right relationship with each other. We begin to live for the best interests of each other. We, we begin to make sure that all of our needs are met because that's what followers of Jesus do. That, my friends, is what God's kingdom is all about. And so the new humanity ultimately is people. People who are committed to living a holy communion life. People who are committed to being broken and poured out for the sake of others. And so it's about us here at K1 being willing to join the world in its suffering and then committing to doing something about it. Feeling their pain, their wrestles, their questions and saying to them, we see you and we are with you. So may we be the new community by being holy communion people, people who are broken and poured out for the sake of others so that other people can come to know this God who saves us through Jesus Christ, who who then gives us freedom, that they may find freedom from every stronghold that may be holding them down in Christ, so they may discover their God purpose in Christ, so they may be able to live it out as a follower of Jesus Christ, in Christ, by being broken and poured out for the sake of others. So my question for you, people K1, is will you be Holy Communion people? Will you be broken and poured out people? What say you, people of K1? What say you? Well, I thought it would be appropriate to end the service then by sharing Holy Communion together. Allowing God through Holy Communion to empower us to be Holy Communion people. So I'm going to ask our servers to come and take the elements and go to your stations as our worship team comes. And we're going to do this in a little different way. This is my favorite way to, to share Holy Communion together. I haven't been able to do it since, since COVID, but we're going to do it this way today. And there will be stations throughout 
the sanctuary. And if you want to receive communion, we will stand together and we will begin to sing. If you want to receive Holy Communion this morning, you'll have an option to do that. If, if you don't want to get up and walk around at some point in time, just raise your hand and our ushers, they have these little communion elements, they will bring them to you. Would everybody here just raise their right hand? I'm not going to ask you to take an oath, I'm just saying. Raise your right hand for this reason. I'm just going to invite you to go to your right. If you go to your right, you can't go wrong, Okay. So if you go to your right, then you can go to your right, and this section can come here. People in the back, we also have communion back there, so you may want to go to your right and go to the people in the back. We have people in the back back here and here. We have people up in the balcony. Again, just go to your right, and you'll be fine. And if you want to sit, just raise your hand. We have two stations that are gluten-free, both in the center right back here with Austin and Maddie Spate, and up top with Dan and Kim DeYoung. And you don't have to be gluten-free to take it from their station, but if you're gluten-free, I highly recommend that you take it there. <laughs> this, my friends, represents Christ's body that was broken for you. And I want you, as you take communion, when you break it off, I want you to remember that so that you will be empowered to go be broken and poured out for someone else. And then someone will have the cup there, and I want you to take that bread, and I want you to dip it in. And after you dip it, I want you to eat it. And again, remember and celebrate everything that God has done for you through the life, the death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then go be broken and poured out people. Does everybody understand? And if you don't want to take communion today, that's okay. Just, just sing. Just stay where you are. Are we good? Oh God, please have your way with us today. Please stand with me as our worship team leads us and then come as you are led. God in heaven, your blood still speaking, your love 
Let's praise him, church. Come on. All right, sing it out. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Through the shadows, the light. 
Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the dark soul for every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. My, my encouragement to you, my challenges to you is, is that you just go and we just go and be holy communion people. People who are broken and poured out for the sake of everyone that God puts in our sphere of influence. So that more and more people can begin to follow the way, live in God's kingdom. Because I believe that if that happens, again, all this crazy evil stuff ends. Think about it, abuse ends. Wouldn't that be beautiful? <laughs> Let's go be those people. When we're tired, when we're depleted, we may have hit a wall like I may have hit a wall today. Man, just go and allow the Spirit to empower you to be broken and poured out for the sake of others. And then just let God do what God does best, heal and restore. So again, I ask, K1, will you be holy communion people? Will you be 
broken and poured out people for the sake of the world. What say you, people, K1? What say you? Well, then may, may you go and live as Holy Communion people. Peace out. Hope I see you next week. <laughs>